Hey everybody, uh, welcome to the Piece of Perspective mailbag. This is number 54, uh, being recorded July 27th, 2018. And uh, I guess by popular demand, it's me? Uh, okay, so, a bunch of questions, uh, Jim compiled. I will try to plow through them and, uh, you know, we can um, do this mailbag thing. Uh, let me make sure my... Mike's not like clipping and stuff. I don't think it is. I hope it's not. I'll drop it down some just in case. All right. Uh, first question from Prasanna. Um, are larger hard drives, uh, 10 terabytes and up, more prone to failure than smaller models? Uh, are they any riskier to use in RAID arrays like ATM machines? RAIDs, yes. Um, now, the risk, yeah, the risk is a little bit higher the bigger the drive that you put in a RAID. Uh, and that comes into play um, when you talk about uh, rebuilds. In other words, when you had a drive fail and you replaced it and now the array needs to be rebuilt, it takes longer to copy more stuff um, to the new drive. If the drive's bigger, it's just going to take longer. Uh, so in that respect, you're at a slight higher risk just because there's longer time that you're at a reduced uh, reliability state of your of your array. Um, as far as uh, like the failure rate type of thing, um, you see some people talk about like, you know, there was this big hoopla years back. Actually, it's funny, it's years back now. But I think when we hit like uh, four or six terabytes, people were doing the math on the uh, unrecoverable bit error rate of drives. And they were saying, well, you can't possibly read the drive front to back without hitting, uh, you know, something you can't recover. And that's kind of not, not how that number actually works, obviously, because now we have 10 terabyte drives, which are, you know, far past what the, the number of those guys were going crazy over. Um, and you can have 10 terabyte drives that are meant for a RAID that are able to read front to back, which is something that has to happen every time you either do what's called uh, like scrubbing the array. In other words, uh, some RAID cards will like periodically scan the entire array. They'll read all drives front to back just to double check, make sure everything's good. Or if you have a drive failure and you have to replace it, then all, uh, all drives, you know, all of the other drives have to be read front to back. And then the new drive has to be written front to back. Um, so, you know, I mean, these things, obviously are successful. Uh, hard drive makers wouldn't really be selling drives that you couldn't at least read the entire span of, uh, you know, without getting an unrecoverable error. Um, now that said, if you're going to get big drives and put them in an array, uh, don't cheap out. Make sure you're getting drives that are meant to be in an array. Um, because that's important. You need this thing called time-limited error recovery. That's a thing that uh, you know, NAS rated drives or like Western Digital Reds or like, you know, any, any of those drives that are just meant rated to be in an array of some form, like NAS drives. Um, you want that because desktop class drives might time out when they hit an error, whereas the NAS rated drives are designed to internally time out like quicker than the RAID card will time out. Um, usually it's like seven seconds or something. Um, so make sure you're doing that because uh, that will increase the chances of if you have another error on another drive while you're in the middle of trying to do one of those rebuilds or anything else where your, your RAID is in a sort of a fragile state, then you're more likely to, you know, for, to get through that, uh, get past that bad spot without another drive going offline on you, which would be, you know, not good depending on what RAID level you were using. Um, so yeah, and uh, of course, the caveat to always use, uh, make sure you're backing your stuff up, right? Uh, any of my arrays, I treat as a black box. That whole box can fail. So everything on that needs to be somewhere else. Even if it's another raid, you just consider it to be another box. But at least everything's in another box, right? Treat it that way. Raid is never a backup. All right, uh, Nick asks... Uh, I have a 950 Pro 512 gig for my boot drive and frequently played games. 
Uh, newer drives like the 970 Evo, so he's going from 950 Pro and talking about 970 Evo, are much faster on paper, but would there be a noticeable difference in my day-to-day -day apps and games if I were to upgrade? So, uh, I looked back at the 970 Evo review, and coincidentally, I did not compare a 950 Pro to it in our comparison charts. So, before I did this mailbag, I pulled up my trusty exploding treadsheet, spreadsheet of, like, all, you know, it's got, like, 200 drives worth of data in there, and I plugged in 950 Pro and 970 Evo, and uh, they're actually really dang close uh, in, in actual performance, uh, as far as, like, you know, the feel of the drive, right? Um, realize a 970 Evo, it's, it's two generations newer, but it's still an Evo drive, meaning when you're reading, when you're, like, doing random reads and even sequential reads, it's still coming from TLC uh, versus MLC on the 950 Pro. Um, so, newer versus older controller, TLC versus MLC flash, it just kind of all balances out because you're, again, you're skipping two generations newer on the drive. Um, so, yeah. They're really close, uh, and they're close enough to where I would say you probably wouldn't notice. Um, 970 Evo might be like, you know, as far as like launching things, that, that mixed burst test I do where there's like a simulated download going on in the background, and then I'm timing how long it takes to read a bunch of data um, off of the drive. I think the, the, the newer Evo was like 10 or 15 or maybe 20% faster than a 950 Pro, uh, but again, they were already, the 950 Pro is already going so fast that you're already reading several gigabytes worth of stuff, and you're only shaving like a half a second off or a second off or something out of, you know, a few seconds worth of activity. So you're you're at diminishing returns uh, for most of the stuff you're going to do, unless you're just super sensitive to to load times and like that extra, you know, quarter second here and there is is going to be painful to you. Um, all right. Um, so there you go. Take that for what it is. Um, next, uh, blown cold one. Uh, what does windows do in terms of drive letters when you add more than 26 drives, A to Z to a system? The answer to your question is absolutely nothing. Uh, <laughs> you just, you ran out of letters. It's not going to give you anymore. Uh, it's not going to mount. Uh, the drive will be in disk management. It'll be in the list. You can scroll down to it. You can right-click on it. You can choose to uh, change the drive letter or add a drive letter. You're just not going to be able to physically add a drive letter because you're out of them. There's nothing to choose. Um, the only thing you can do is you can mount it as a folder, which is actually another option. Uh, even if you like pull up your, your disk management and you look at your C drive right now, if you right-click on it... Um, Right click on your C drive and you hit, uh, you know, you hit change drive letter, you'll see that there is a option to mount, also mount it as a folder. And the idea there is you would make an empty folder on like your C drive or whatnot or wherever you wanted to have all these extra drives hanging off of. Um, you could name them. Like if you, that's an advantage too. It doesn't have to be a letter anymore. You can actually just name the folder like what you wanted. And then you can mount to the drive. And it Windows sort of just like sticks it in that folder. So all the contents of that drive now appear in that folder of that other drive. Um, just be careful uh, because I think if you like were to have that folder selected and hit delete, uh, Windows would start trying to delete the contents of the whole drive. So yeah, there's that. Um, but you know, it is what it is. Uh, you only get 26. If you have 26 drives, you should probably be consolidating it in some other way anyway, because that's just, that's too many drives. Anyway, uh, Sean writes, uh, I'm running Unraid server with two parity drives. I understand how the first parity drive works, but how does the second one work? I've read its Reed Solomon code, but have not found a basic explanation of how that works. Yeah, uh, there is no basic explanation of how Reed Solomon code works. Um, so... I'll ex briefly explain the parity drive thing, uh, just, you know, because, uh, so the, the other folks that maybe don't know what the heck parity drive, uh, how that thing works, uh, will understand, but at the very fundamentals, it's just, you take what's called a stripe, which is a, a piece of data at the same address, same location across all of the drives in the array, 
um, and you take that data and you XOR it. In other words, you take like the first byte and you do an XOR between that byte and the byte on the next drive and the byte on the next drive. And you keep going until you've run out of drives with data on them. And the drive that's left is going to be the parity drive or the drive that just happens to be calling, uh, holding the stripe of parity. And for, for raids, that's distributed. In other words, that parity stripe kind of jumps around uh, as you, depending on where you're, where you're looking. Um, but the result that's stored as parity is just nothing but an XOR of all those other drives. So if one of those drives fails, even the, the drive with the parity stripe, if that fails, doesn't matter which one, uh, the math for XOR is very simple. Uh, because you, you all, you, if you want to know the result of what fits in any of those missing spots, you just take all of the remaining uh, bytes from all of the remaining drives, and you just calculate the XOR of all of those. And almost magically, the result is the missing piece, even if it was the parity or even if it was data on one of the other drives that were holding data. It's, it's really simple. It's math that a processor can do pretty quick. It's just an XOR. They, they're kind of quick at that. It's a basic logic operation. Um, so that's all good and, and fine. What gets tricky is when you try to do RAID 6 uh, because RAID 6 is not like... Now you had, you're two layers deep on which thing can fail, right? Uh, and it has to get more complicated because of that. You, so if you had one drive fail, say the first drive failed, okay, well now you know that your XOR is going to give you that thing back. But if you, you have to be able to also account for a second failure, which can be any of the other drives, and you can't just do simple XOR math to get the two back easily. You have to somehow distribute it in a different way or do the math in a different way so that you're able to fill in any random two missing chunks out of that stripe. Um, read Solomon code is one way. The easiest thing I could think of for you to research and understand what read Solomon code is, is that error correction of CDs works the same exact way. In other words, what's called C1 and C2 are the two layers of error correction codes that are on CDs. Uh, if you've read a CD raw with the program in the past, you were actually like the raw image, not the ISO, but like the raw was actually a slightly larger size than what the ISO would be. And that's because that contains C2. Uh, you could actually take a raw CD image and you can actually like run it through, a, there was a piece of software, I don't remember, what the name of it is, but, but back in the day, you can run a raw CD image through a piece of software that would actually check all of the C2 Reed Solomon codes against all of the data, and it would make sure everything was good, or if you had, like, bad reads from your CD drive, it could actually correct them based on that code. Um, the C1 data, you can't read, usually, but pretty much with anything. I don't think there's anything that'll read C1 data. But that is decoded on the fly by hardware in the CD-ROM drive. Um, and the C1 is also does some other things because it's like, it's sort of, the, the ones and zeros are sort of scrambled in a way. It's like a limitation of optical storage that you don't want too many zeros in a row or too many ones in a row because it'll just kind of confuse things. You want to be alternating between ones and zeros. So they took, you know, there's so many bits of data gets kind of like reduced down to a smaller number of bits of data along with the error correction, the, the C1 error correction taking place. Um, but again, it's nothing more than added bits of data that are able to fix bad bits of data or error bits of data. Um, and the Reed Solomon then kind of ventures into like matrix math. It's just that you're not doing it. It's, it's just like one layer more complex than doing XOR things just because you're trying to fill random holes instead of, uh, you know, one hole that could have been anywhere. Um, and there's even, there's even other... Uh, just because you have a RAID 6, it doesn't mean it's using Reed Solomon. There's other methods. It's vendor to vendor. It varies. Reed Solomon's probably the most common, but there are other ones. Uh, it's just, you know, just do some sort of math that can compensate for 
a second missing drive or a third missing drive. That's that's really all it's down to. Um, it's just that it's more complicated trying to, you know, when you start making it, uh, you know, any random, any possible number, uh, any any possible positions can fail, right? Anyway, sorry if that wasn't technical enough for you, but I'm trying not to go over the heads of, like, everybody and bust out whiteboards and, and stuff. Um, next up. Uh, Peter asks, uh, when could you benefit from disabling hyperthreading on a processor? So I haven't done this in a long time, uh, but back when I ran, like, a pair of Xeons, like the first hyperthreaded Xeons, uh, there was actually a noticeable difference in performance. Uh, if you were running a single-threaded app, you know, or a th an app that was only using, you know, half of the available threads when it was hyperthreaded, if you turned hyperthreading off, you would actually get a performance gain. Um, because when you have hyperthreading on, you're trying to... There, there are certain parts, uh, certain parts of the architecture, parts of the pipelines that are split in half, right? Uh, you know, some of the caching is divided between the two halves, right? Now that's changed over time, and it's, it's the performance penalty is less and less. I think back on that first generation stuff, it was like a, it was like a good improvement. It was like a ten percent change. Um, that's not as big of a change now but it's still potentially a change. So if you're, if you are barely using the threads on your processor and you're now granted normal desktop use, you're barely using all the threads on your processor. But if you're using a game that happens to be heavily threaded or if you're doing some sort of encoding, that's the points where hyper-threading is super advantageous because you're doubling your you know number of threads available and that scales pretty good on modern hardware. But if you're never ever doing that stuff, uh, you can turn it off, and you might actually see some of a boost. Uh, it's possible. It's not going to be enormous, again, um, you know, but it might be a few percent. So that would be the only uh, possible benefit of, of doing it, is, you know, potentially impro improving your performance slightly. Uh, J.T. Russell III asks, um, Is Optane dead now that Intel and Micron have ended their working relationship? Well, first... They haven't ended their working relationship with respect to Optane specifically in that they're working on the second generation of it together still. Um, but the thing is, they're both going to own that IP even after they're split. And they're both making it. So, like, Intel might choose to improve on it in one way, while Micron might choose to improve on it in another way. It's not like, oh, no, we're not jointly... Uh, we're not jointly developing it anymore, so that means we can't make it anymore, right? Um, you know, they still they're still gonna have joint fab space, uh, like in, in Utah, I think, is the the fab that makes all the cross point. Um, so I don't I don't think either one of them is just gonna back out of that fab. And if they did, they still own the intellectual property. They from for, at least from the point where they split. Um, so they're still going to be able to, you know, do things with it on their own, right? Um, you know, Micron can just, because Micron really hasn't launched any any products that have Crosspoint in there. Uh, maybe they were just in it f to contribute the research and, and you know, make, make some money on their investment in the research part of it. And maybe they just don't want to have to deal with marketing and selling the product like Intel has. Who knows, right? Um, but, you know, just... Time will tell as, as far as how that's going to pan out. Um, let's see here. Uh, Daniel, I think that is. Sorry, I don't know if I'm reading that right. Can we expect the next-gen Xbox and PlayStation consoles to finally ditch the hard drives and ship with solid-state storage? I would love it if they would do that. However, uh, consoles are sort of unique in that they, you know, it's not like your typical PC where you might have 100 games you own on Steam, but you're only downloading and playing, you know, a couple of them at a time, and you can kind of manage that easier. Whereas, you know, for consoles, it's more like, well, I got that game, and the console just downloads it, right? Um, so, point being, consoles, it's probably more advantageous to them to have a decent amount of storage. Um, also, console games, 
for the most part, are developed with hard drive storage in mind, and they've been that way for a while, meaning all the tools kind of already, you know, like, you know, all the the, to, the to, development tools that are out there will tend to take, like, a level worth of textures and or, a, a, you know, a segment worth of all the material that's needed. They kind of pack them into one file, and then that file is read more, more or less sequentially, uh, you know, and just done in a way that's, more consu- conducive to where it doesn't matter if it's a hard drive or an SSD. Uh, there are still some things where you know SSD helps, but um, you know if you if you own the platform and you can do with it that you wish, uh, you can make the pain a lot less for hard drive, and you can make it almost sort of transparent to the to the user. The other part is consoles are super about like margins, to the point where they're like you know, they're, they're making their money back on trying to sell the game so that they can sell the console even cheaper. In other words, it's costing them money to sell you the console and they're hoping that you're going to buy X number of games to pay it. So if they're already in that position where it's that competitive, uh, there would have to be a super, super advantage to the SSD thing, uh, to, to make them spend that extra money and, and lose even more margin on the console. Um, and given that all the development stuff is kind of tailored to, you know, making it workable and, uh, it, you know, not painful on a hard disk, like like Windows on a hard disk is painful, but console games running off a hard disk is really not painful compared to the SSD thing. So I, I just don't see it happening. Like, I wouldn't be I'm totally not surprised if like the next generation consoles that gets announced, they're still hard disks. Maybe they throw some flash-based cache in there or something or just small thing, but I don't expect your console to just come with like pure solid state anytime soon. I'm thinking. I could be wrong, but that's that's just the way I see it going based on uh, based on all the factors that I know. Um next up. Uh who what the heck is that name? Al at al Aliopath. I don't know. I got nothing. Um, is there anything on the radar that will help lower the cost per gig of SSDs beyond process shrinks, more layers, and more bits per cell? Well, you named all the things, so you, there's nothing left. Um, you know, other than just it just gets cheaper just by volume right? Uh, even if you don't change any of those other things, uh, if you're producing something more in mass, uh, then it gets somewhat cheaper just from that, right? Um, so just adoption of SSDs kind of helps that just in general, but there's really, we're still like struggling to keep up with demand on, on flash media, uh, in the current day. So since flash media is like, you know, getting snatched up as soon as it's made, pretty much. We could probably use some more fabs, honestly, <laughs> for Flash. But, you know, that's money. That's big investments, and then that's, you know, stuff that, again, needs to, need, has to be recouped. So we're kind of caught in the in the ramp-up still on that, and people are hesitant to invest too much in a fab on the current technology because, again, the other things are still happening, Right. All the things you mentioned, shrinks and more layers and more bits per cell and things like that. Um, actually, I still need to... I was going to try to do a, a small wrap-up post on, like, here's these different news things that have come out recently. Uh, just talking about, like, as an example, Samsung is not just shrinking... Uh, they're not just shrinking X and Y anymore. They're actually shrinking Z so that they can get more layers. In other words... Uh, it's it's hard to punch those holes. The holes are actually etched into the flash, uh, into the into the silicon, in order to make the vertical sections that you see in in 3D flash. Um, you can only etch holes so deep in a straight line. Eventually, you know the tunnels start to curve and do weird things, and it's it's a really hard uh, problem to solve. So. Now guys are starting to squish the Z height, right? If you can make it shallower or if you could fit more layers into the same thickness, uh, then you don't have to solve that other problem because you're still etching the same distance, right? Um, Yeah, but 
those are the kinds of things that are that you know people are trying to overcome so um the other thing that'll help lower the cost is if somehow the demand went down <laughs> um I don't see that happen anytime soon, given it's it's not so much the the you and me problem, it's it's the enterprise problem and well indirectly due to you and me using online services where the cloud providers need to have a bunch of flash available. Um and it's just cloud based services. So uh which kind of sucks for the retail, just the guy who wants to upgrade his laptop and uh in his PC or his SSD in his PC or in his laptop, uh, because the flash still costs X amount of money, whether it's going to the, you know, the big enterprise or it's going to the you and me. Anyway, um, Damien asks, uh, Seagate's gotten a bad rap in the professional space. Is it warranted? Do you recommend their iron wolf pro drives, especially compared to equivalent Western digital models? I don't have hard numbers. Uh, I can agree with you on the Seagate reputation part, uh, because I've personally had some Seagate drives fail myself. Uh, Ryan's had some fail. I've had to do raid recoveries for Ryan because he's had drives fail in a raid back when he was using Seagates. Um, you know, I've had friends that have had issues like that. Not to say that there hasn't been failures from other companies as well, but just in my personal experience, it's been more Seagate failures than, uh, you know, than the other guys. Um, Iron Wolf Pro, however, uh, again, I don't have hard numbers yet to back this up, but the Iron Wolf Pro drives are helium filled. And I personally am of the belief that like broad stroke, generally speaking, uh, a hermetically sealed helium filled drive is probably more reliable than a drive that's exposed to the atmosphere you know, and exposed to barometric pressure changes and humidity and things like that, right? It's a mechanical thing. If you can make one that's hermetically sealed where just nothing touches it, um, you know, it's probably going to do better just just as a hunch, right? Um, Western Digital they got a really nice boost on their helium filled drives. And that also translates to like, you know, their reds and, and drives like that. Now, uh, their boost came from their getting together with HGST. HGST was making these really amazingly rated helium drives, uh, you know, that were had really low failure rates. Um, I don't think we have enough data from all the other guys that are now introducing helium filled drives. Like they just haven't been around long enough to really have a track record. Um, but if you base it just on the helium thing in general, like just when you move to that technology, there just seems to be an advantage, um, to the reliability. Again, not a guarantee. And I can't like, you know, I don't want to take the HDST slash Washington Digital thing and just broad stroke it like all helium filled drives are amazing, but it's it's giving you an advantage, right? So I would, I would, I'm more confident in Iron Wolf Pro uh, over prior Seagate drives. In addition to the fact that <laughs> Seagate seems to have just gone through a rough patch there where they were having like some particular ranges of years or models of drives were just having not great, uh, you know, failure rates. Um, and you know, don't, don't try to have a short term memory on this though, because even though Seagate's been the one recently, like Western digital had this patch where back when they were making somewhere around like the 400 gig drives, I had six of those in an array and like two failed within a week. Like, and it was just, you know, they were just going on a lot of people. Like you were seeing forum posts back then about I mean, people complaining about them. And then before that, it was the death star drives, right? Um, you know, what was supposed to be the desk star, but people called them death star because if you put your stuff on it, it was just probably going to go away in a short amount of time. So everybody seems to kind of go through those and they generally learn from them and, you know, don't want that bad rap. So you kind of have that going for you as well with the Seagate Iron Wolf being a recent, uh, line from Seagate. I'm sure they didn't want to have that same kind of rap carried forward. Um, so yeah, there you have it. Uh, that's the end of the thing. Um, 
these are or at least that's the end of the questions that Jim asked. Um, I think there were a few on Twitter that uh, I don't want to take the time right this second to go back and look at, but I will like find them on Twitter and just reply to them, I guess. Um, all right, that's it. Uh, if you got more questions for us for the mailbag, uh, ask in uh, if you're watching this on YouTube, post something in the comments. If you're watching it uh, in line on the PC per post, uh, leave a comment there. We pay attention to both places. Um, or you can just, you know, tweet at PC per. I think we're, we're paying attention to those. It helps if you do it a couple of days before the mailbag. So like, you know, Monday ish, Tuesday, uh, then you're more likely to be on the radar. Uh, and you're more likely for us to kind of see those as they're coming in. Jim does a pretty good job about keeping an eye on that every so often anyway, like throughout the week. Um, all right. So with that, uh, I'm Alan Malentano, and uh, see you guys. Uh, I won't see you in the next one, but I'll see you on the podcast and stuff, and somebody else will see you in the next mailbag, or maybe it'll be me. I don't know. Anyway, see you here.